Welcome to the Midland Conservation District's Educational Workshop, Industrial Hemp. You think it's pot, but it's not. The importance of this plant and its many uses creates quite a buzz. It is important to know the difference between marijuana and industrial hemp. We saw the need in the community to bring this information to you. So in a joint effort, we made this workshop possible with all of our panelists and our, our experts on the subject tonight. I'd like to thank all the great panelists we have tonight to help supply you with this, the correct information and the information you need to know. So we all have one goal in common, supply you with the correct information so you can decide if hemp is a crop or a business that is right for you. Tonight, our first speaker, well, here's, here's a list of our panelists. Again, I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight. And Sumatsu is um, Corporation is actually supplying the door prizes for us tonight, so thank you. There's their information. They are um, suppliers of testing equipment. And tonight's first speaker again, Gina Alessandre, MDART Industrial Hemp Program Director. Happy to be here today to talk about the state's newest commodity, the department's newest program. Um, we're going to pull up a PowerPoint. Uh, of course, it's like support knocks with state government equipment, so I just need to bear with me for a minute. What I'd like to do today is I'm going to actually, I'd like to first ask how many did anybody in the audience actually grow industrial hemp this year? No? Oh, okay, so a couple people did. So others are thinking about getting into it, and it's a good thing that you're here, um, hearing from a lot of experts uh, before you make that decision. This is a, this is a crop that um, does have risks associated with it, and so it's good that you're gathering information first uh, as you're making that decision. So what I'm going to what I'm going to cover as part of this presentation is first of all we're going to talk a little bit about what hemp is, how it's different. Uh, find the one that says um, myths. Uh, well, I didn't see that one on there, so just choose one. How about? Um, just do that for me real quick. We're going to talk about what industrial hemp is, how it's different from marijuana. We'll talk a little bit about the history of industrial hemp, and that's important. Really, I just want to emphasize uh, how it relates to where the program is today. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Ag Pilot Program that we implemented in 2019. Uh, some of the lessons that we learned, and I'm going to buzz through this really quickly because we've got a lot of speakers up here that have a lot of great information to share. So um, let me just get forward here, go forward here. All right, covered that. So this um, this slide is actually the definition of industrial hemp, and I'm not going to read it to you, but I want you to focus on what's underlined up there. Industrial hemp comes from the same plant that marijuana comes from, but the difference is that industrial hemp has this THC concentration of less than 0.3 percent. That's critical for this program. THC, if you're not familiar, is one of at least 113 different cannabinoids in um, cannabis and it's what causes the psychoactive effect that marijuana causes. So, um, so that's why it has to be less than 0.3 percent to be considered industrial hemp. Four key differences. Number one, chemistry. If you like chemistry, you're in good, good shape here because that's really what it boils down to. It boils down to that level of THC. 0.3% uh, is non-intoxicating. Marijuana, on the other hand, can have anywhere from 5% to 35% THC, and it is intoxicating. So that chemical concentration then leads to the legality of the crop. Industrial hemp is now considered to be legal. It can legally be uh, grown, processed, transported, possessed, stored sold um, 
it's been removed from that controlled substance list. Marijuana, on the other hand, remains illegal at the federal level and is, is still on that controlled substance list. Third key difference is the cultivation. Industrial hemp is typically grown outdoors, uh, can grow up to 20 feet depending on the variety that you're planting and depending on what purpose. Those very long, tall plants are typically grown for fiber. Being grown for CBD, it's a much shorter, bushier plant. Marijuana, on the other hand, is typically grown indoors in very controlled environments where they're monitoring the temperature, the lighting, the humidity, and they're obviously wanting to keep those plants much shorter, much bushier, uh, lots of flowers and uh, buds. Last key difference is really the uses. There are more than 20,000 different uses of industrial hemp. Uh, I've got a lot of them pictured and listed up there. Uh, there's certainly a lot of uses in the, the paper, textile, construction markets, clothing, auto parts, plastics, animal bedding. And then there's the whole medicinal side of it where I'm sure you've all seen CBD oil for sale and a lot of the therapeutic and, uh, claims that, that uh, come along with that product. Marijuana, again, on the other hand, is typically used for its recreational or therapeutic uses. Quick run through of this history, and some of it you probably heard on the previous video. First introduced in North America in the 1600s, uh, government recognized the utility of the crop in the 1700s and actually required growers to actually grow it. Uh, our draft of our Declaration of Independence was written on hemp paper, and Abraham Lincoln used uh, uh, the oil squeezed from the seeds to fuel his household lamps. Attitudes began to change in the 1900s when government wanted to start cracking down on uh, drug use. And it was, uh, hemp production was uh, severely discouraged in 1937 when the Marijuana Tax Act was enacted, placing a tax on all cannabis sales. There was a brief resurgence during the war, which is where I think that, that video came from. Um, the government recognized it needed hemp for sales, to, to make the sales for our, our Navy ships. Um, and so 400,000 acres were planted in the 40s, but then the last commercial hemp field was planted in, the 19, in 1957, I believe, in Wisconsin. And then the nail in the coffin really happened in the 1970s when the Controlled Substance Act was passed. and. Uh, hemp got classified with its cannabis cousin, marijuana, and was put on this controlled substance list right next to heroin and LSD. So things started to change in 2014, and I want to emphasize this because this is really where the program is today for us. The 2014 Farm Bill authorized state departments of agriculture or colleges and universities to study the growth of industrial hemp. And in in 2014, uh, we also then enacted Michigan Public Act 547, which would, allowed, which would have allowed us to create a pilot program to study this crop. Only problem is there really wasn't a lot of interest at that time uh, to conduct research on hemp. It was still illegal in 2014, and so although we could have initiated a pilot program, we didn't. States like Kentucky, Colorado, um, those states that are much further ahead than we are, took advantage of this 2014 opportunity. We didn't here. 2018 uh, really is why we're all here today. Uh, the 2018 Farm Bill legalized industrial hemp. It named USDA as the federal agency for oversight. Uh, it, it gives states the authority to regulate industrial hemp at the state level if we want to. But if we do, it requires that we submit a state plan to USDA for approval. It also directed USDA to promulgate rules that would give states guidance on building that state plan. And uh, lastly, it maintained all of FDA's authority uh, related to any compounds being added to food or being marketed with therapeutic or uh, medicinal claims. So that public act 547 that I mentioned back in 2014 was amended uh, and is now public act 641. That one was also signed at the end of December, kind of just about the same time that the Farm Bill was signed. And that's our current state law. Um, one thing that the feds realized was that they were not going to be able to approve any state plans until after they promulgated their rules. 
They knew they weren't going to have that in time for the done in time for the 2019 growing season, but promised to have it done in time for the 2020 growing season. So meanwhile, they said states could continue to operate under the authority of the 2014 Farm Bill, which was the one that allowed the research. And so that's what we did. In April of 2019, we implemented our Ag Pilot Program, which basically allowed growers, processors to get into the, the hemp business if they wanted to uh, under a research agreement with MDARD, as if they were uh, basically conducting research on behalf of the department. So in 2019, um, it allowed this growing as long as uh, individuals had the proper licensure, as long as they had a background check, which uh, proved that they didn't have any felony drug convictions on their record, and as long as they signed off on that research agreement. So we registered 603 growers for 2019. Those growers identified 850 different outdoor growing locations. Uh, more than 15,000 acres, and then we also had a lot of indoor growing locations identified, and uh, those um, added up to more than 10 million square feet. We licensed 483 processors and handlers. Um, a caveat here is that's not a true reflection of the number of processors we have in the state, and that's because of the language in the law, which requires anybody who's processing, handling, brokering, or marketing industrial hemp to have this license. So that number uh, represents a lot of people that are actually selling industrial hemp. Uh, I would guess that we probably have anywhere from a dozen to maybe 20 at the most true processors in Michigan right now that will come, more will come online with time. Um, Public Act 641 requires that uh, samples be submitted to our lab prior to harvest so that we can confirm that that THC concentration is in compliance. So MDARD's lab provided that testing service this year, about a three-day turnaround, and the law also requires that the hemp be harvested within 15 days after those results are communicated back to you. So we uh, tested 847 samples, had a pretty decent compliance rate for our first year at this, uh, the law actually allows for three repeats, or two, two additional tests after that first one is submitted. We had very few of those um, uh, submitted to us. So um, there's a, a list of some of those issues. The U.S. Postal Service um, wasn't our friend on a couple of occasions. We had some issues with, not, with growers not submitting samples, which we're chasing them right now, trying to find out why that was. Um, and one thing is that we know that growers haven't been checking their email regularly, which is our primary way of communicating with them. Quickly, some of the lessons that we learned in 2019 is we don't have all the answers yet. We're still waiting on guidance at the federal level, especially from FDA as it relates to any cannabis-derived compounds that are being added to food or beverage or that are being marketed um, interstate with therapeutic claims. We know that growing hemp is very labor intensive. I'm sure some folks up here will be able to uh, sh share more about that. Primarily hand harvested if you were growing for CBD purposes. Uh, and like I mentioned before, we need, we need more processors and our production and processes and um, equipment need to evolve with time. Uh, this crop requires growers to be super attentive, and that boils down to that THC concentration. You don't want to get caught at the end of the season with a THC that exceeds 0.3% because then you basically have to destroy your crop. So growers are having to pay attention throughout the growing season to see what those THC levels are. And again, uh, the sample, the regulatory sample, needs to be submitted to MDARD pre-harvest, which means you need to sort of time that sample submission um, with the THC levels and harvest and all of that stuff. So again, you need to pay a lot of attention to this crop. You can't just plant it and then wait till harvest time. We, we heard loud and clear that cross-pollination is a concern, not only for hemp growers, but also for hemp processors, or excuse me, um, marijuana growers, I'm sorry. Uh, hemp and marijuana both have issues with pollination. We need more processors. I talked about that a minute ago. There's an ongoing need for outreach and education. Uh, some examples of industries or areas that um, we've had 
have lots of communication with, the banking industry, uh, local units of government who have some misunderstanding related to whether or not they can opt in or opt out of allowing hemp to be grown in their communities. Law enforcement obviously needs help identifying uh, hemp growing operations um, from marijuana growing operations. We know we need to find a better way of connecting growers and processors. We had trouble with that this year because of the because of the language in our law that's um, FOIA, Freedom of Information Act language, which prohibited us from sharing that information. Uh, that being said, there is a legitimate need to connect growers and processors, so we need to work on that a little bit. And there will always be intersecting issues with, with the marijuana laws, uh, working with them constantly to make sure that we're talking about those issues and clarifying roles and responsibilities. Breaking news, so uh, USDA kept their promise and they released their interim rules on October 31st. Uh, based on the number of comments that they were receiving, they actually extended the 30-day public comment period an additional 30 days. So at the end of January, uh, they ended up receiving over 4,600 comments from individuals, from businesses, from regulators, and by law, they are now required to read every single one of them. So they're in the process of doing that. Uh, so the interim rules which were released basically require us to be in compliance with everything that's in the interim rules come this October, so October 31st of 2020. That being said, we're still going to be operating under a pilot program for the 2020 season, at least until we get to October 31st when we need to be in compliance with the USDA's interim rules. That's, the timing is, um, not great. I mean, that will mean we'll have to transition from a pilot program to the interim rules, uh, really kind of at the tail end of harvest. So hopefully, we'll get all of our growers to submit their to submit their samples in before October 31st. Otherwise, things change and the requirements of the interim rules uh, become effective then. Wanted to just share that this program will always be regulated by government. If we don't submit a state plan and get that approved by USDA, then the feds will run the program in the state. Some states are electing to just let the feds run the program. Uh, in Michigan, our plans are to get us uh, a state plan submitted this summer. And that's, I think, what, oh. Do I still have time to go through some of the things on the floor? Okay, just quickly, um, some of the headlines from what's in the interim rules that are different from what's currently in our state law. Uh, there's going to be some new reporting requirements for growers. Growers are going to have to report their hemp acreage to USDA Farm Service Agency. That's new. That Our law doesn't currently require that. Uh -oh. um, so, so that's one thing. I'll keep going while you're playing with that. Um, the other thing is the rule is uh, pretty heavy on DEA, uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Drug Enforcement Agency. It requires that laboratories that are DEA registered are the only ones that can actually run samples. Now, in Michigan, our lab is DEA registered, so that shouldn't be a problem for us. But they're also requiring collection of samples by either law enforcement or a DEA authorized individual. So. Uh, currently, growers are allowed to submit their own samples to MDAR pre-harvest for that regulatory sample. After October 31st, uh, somebody else, MDAR basically, will be coming out and having to take those samples. There's also a lot of CE, uh, Control Substance Act and DEA requirements related to effective disposal of non-compliant plants. And you know they're saying that it has to be in accordance with Control Substance Act, which if any of you have read that, um, is very, uh, very much directed towards effective disposal of prescription drugs. Not even close to how you would uh, effectively destroy or get rid of five acres of hemp that's still standing in the ground. So that is an area that I know has caused a lot of heartburn for regulators, for a lot of the people that submitted comments. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how they resolve that. Um, going here, a couple more things that are new. 
really this is for the benefit of our law enforcement. There are going to be lots of new reporting requirements for MDARD, and USDA is planning on maintaining a database, a real-time database, so that law enforcement can access it to determine if the field that they're, uh, you know, the complaints that they're responding to or the field that they're looking at is actually a, hemp, a licensed hemp grower or not. There's lots of uh, annual inspection requirements which the department will have to comply with and um, their, the background check will continue. That's not currently in our state law, but the feds are gonna require that we, that we add that. So that's something that will be added to our state law. Um, so next steps, and this is the, pretty much my last slide. So in order for MDAR to submit a state plan, we have to make some changes to Public Act 641. That's in process right now. We're working with uh, representatives from industry, talking about the scope of change needed, and our goal is to have that completed by the end of June. Uh, we'll very quickly, right after that, then submit a state plan for approval. USDA has six, they have, they're allowed up to 60 days to review and either approve or reject our plan, I don't think it will take them that long, but we're factoring that into our process. And again, bottom line, by October 31st, we have to be in compliance with the interim rules, which are those last couple of slides that I just went over. MDARD has a industrial hemp website. For any of you who are interested, you can check that out, just michigan.gov slash industrial hemp. We have all of our licenses out there. There's, you can get a copy of Public Act 641 out there. There's an opportunity, if you're interested, There's a uh, you can self-subscribe to a listserv, which is the tool that we're using to communicate updates about the program. Uh, so you can always self-subscribe to that if you want, and unsubscribe when you're getting tired of seeing the emails. We don't send out a lot, maybe one or two a month, if we're lucky. So um, please do look at the website, and, uh, and you can get contacts out there as well. So if you have specific questions, my information's out there, you can always call me and I'm happy to help answer any specific questions that you might have. Okay. Sorry about the lighting in here, we either have bright or this. So this gets our choice. So next up, we're going to have Joel Johnson, the State Director of the Michigan USDA Farm Service Agency, and he's going to give us some uh, information on their USDA programs. And we will open this up to questions when we're all done, so stick around and then we'll do the door prizes.
to take part in is the RMA whole farm revenue uh, protection. And we do have an RMA multi-parallel, oops, a multi-parallel crop insurance, which would be uh, handled through regular crop insurance agents. And that's a pilot program this year and available in most counties in Michigan. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there's not an NRCS conservation programs, but also the FSA non-insured crop disaster assistance program is uh, an insurance program per se that uh, normally is available to only crops that are not uh, insured under the RMA program in the particular county that you're working in. In this case, since it's a pilot program for the RMA program, you can also purchase coverage under the Not Insured Crop Disaster Program, or NAP for short. Uh, the problem, and there are some differences between the two, so you need to talk to a crop insurance person and a person at FSA and talk about some of the differences in coverage, because the issue is that you can only collect from one of these insurance. You can, you can pay the premium on both, but you can only collect from one. So <laughs> think of that. Uh, so you want, you want to really look at what is probably the best coverage for you and choose one. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I would point out while we're talking about that here is just uh, something to keep in mind is that uh, Gina talked about the uh, compliance of under of 0.3 or under percent THC, that is not an insurable loss. So uh, under either program, you cannot buy insurance for being under 0.3 THC. That's your own risk. So, uh, so be aware of that. Um, another thing is farms, farm storage facility loans uh, and FSA farm loans. So uh, a few highlights about farm storage facility loans. Uh, the uh, maximum loan amount is $500,000 per application. Loan terms are either three, five, seven, 10, or 12 years, depending on the loan amount. And the down payment is between 5% and 15% based on the loan amount. The interest rate, I will add, is very, uh, very good. You would be very happy with that. Um, can't tell you right offhand what that is right now, Gerald. Do you? Anything between one and a half and two and a half. Yeah. Between one and a half and two and a half percent interest rate. So it's it's a good program. You you'll need to uh, justify the need for how much storage you need. Uh, that's usually based. That is based on up to two years worth of production for the acreage that you that you have, and it is. It's strictly for storing the commodity that you grow. You can't rent that storage out to someone else. It's not designed for storing uh, equipment, that sort of thing. It's designed, in this case, it's for hemp. It's for the storage of the hemp. We have the same type of program for grains and that sort of thing as well. Uh, so then we also have regular farm loans. We, all, we have uh, Gerald Wagler. Garrett Dranchek with me here tonight as well, who are in the farm loan area of our agency. And uh, so we encourage people to come in and talk about uh, other farm loans, which would be farm ownership and, uh, and farm, uh, farm operation, operating loans. And so uh, the hemp being new especially, has some unique risk exposure for both applicants and FSA, and does remain highly regulated for uh, farm loan participation. So there's some, some hurdles that we have to, uh, to go through uh, with that, and as with any, with any farm loan or any other loan. Uh, so again, with this, you have to be licensed under the state or tribal plan. Here it's with MDARD. Uh, and the Another requirement, uh, you, have to, uh, you have to provide your, lic your license number, and uh, you also have to have a contract to sell the hemp. 
So with a purchaser that can be counted on and with uh, it's very strictly laid out as to what would be a reason that they would not purchase your account. Uh, so uh, that's something there. Okay, so these are some other, uh, these are some websites for some resources uh, that you can get more information. There, there is a fair amount of information out there. Most of these sites are interactive and will take you uh, further and further into this. You can look at the interim rules and uh, lots of different things to go to go along with now. We got a couple minutes for questions. Is there, is there any questions out there? Well, you're going to get a lot more information from other people, and, and we'll be here at the end in case there's more questions. All right, next up, we're going to have Dr. Eric Anderson. We're getting his presentation loaded here. He is a field crop educator for MSU, Go State. And he is going to talk about agronomy, soil health, and other benefits the plant has.
little bit on the economy. How many growers in general are out here? Uh, you're either a farmer or you're interested in growing at all. Maybe a handful. And so I'm going to just go through the economy briefly because not a lot of folks are, are in that area. But some of the questions that we were getting were, can I grow hemp in Michigan? This was an early question. They were just wondering, well, is it too cold or is it enough rain? Uh, and for the most part, the answer is yes. Any place in Michigan, uh, there's hemp growing, lots of hemp growing in Canada, and so it's not really a cold issue. Uh, there's different varieties that are adapted to the different climates. And here in Michigan, our temp, our precipitation, for the most part, if you can grow a row crop there, you can grow hemp there. Same thing is true with the soils. Pretty much any soil is fine as long as it's well drained. And so if you have a heavier, more like a clay soil, uh, you've got to have tiles to uh, planting in April or May, and that really just depends on the type of hemp that you're growing. Uh, once soil temperatures are up warm enough, then again, you can grow corn or soybean, you can grow hemp. Uh, for various reasons, uh, tillage is recommended, but it's definitely not uh, required. For planting, if you're planting a fiber or grain crop, uh, it's a fairly shallow seeded crop, and so maybe three eighths of an inch deep, you can do that with uh, what they call a drill controlled spill, or you can do it with uh, basically a broadcast seeder, and then a cultipacker is a piece of equipment that just pats it down, gets good seed soil contact. For fiber, you're looking at something like 40 to 50 pounds of seed per acre, uh, something like a million seed. Uh, and if you remember from that video, uh, they showed those fibers, they're, they're really, the stand is really dense. There's a lot of the plants in a small area, and there's not a lot of branching, there's not a lot of foliage down below. You really just want a very skinny plant that grows really tall for those fibers. Eight inch or less, so essentially maybe like a seven and a half inch row, keep those row spacings tight. That also helps with weed control. For grain, very similar, maybe drop that seeding rate down a little bit. You can allow maybe a little bit more space for branching because for seed, you're wanting flower production. So you're wanting a little bit of branching for that grain to grow on the plant. This just gives you a really general sense as to how much you can expect to pay for these different either seed or clones. So I won't talk too much about the, the CBD side, so CBD clones, seeds, uh, feminized versus non-feminized. If you're not sure what that is, ask during that panel time. But the industrial seeds up though, and that's what you would be planting if you were you know, growing it for grain or fiber. Uh, something like five dollars per pound. So if you just do the math, if you were planting, let's say, you know, thirty pounds per acre, you get a general sense of some of the inputs for growing the grain of fiber crop. By the way, just contrast that with some of these other numbers. So, for example, non-feminized seed for CBD, one of the, the cheaper ways to grow that. You're looking at. Uh, I've seen that down as low as five hundred. So that fifteen hundred don't like that scary. But it's it's definitely it's like uh, two orders of magnitude greater just because you're growing it for that cannabinoid production. Uh, I'll just mention really briefly about the CBD production just to contrast it. So uh, everything that I just said uh, two slides ago, compared to this, you're looking at more like 1,500 to 2,000 plants per acre versus you know tens or hundreds of thousands of plants. For CBD production, you're only wanting female plants. That's a big deal because the, the cannabinoid, that CBD, is really only found in the flowers to a lesser extent than the leaves, and so you really don't want any males out there for a number of reasons. Uh, the, the pollen that the males would produce can travel a long ways. Uh, three to 10 miles is what you'll hear a lot of folks say. Uh, definitely within the first 10 miles, that, that pollen uh, will drop off with distance, uh, but it becomes an issue with pollen contamination. Uh, because you don't want males, you don't want males in your own field, you also don't want uh, males in adjoining fields, but for your fields, you may need to go out and road, and you know, you're pulling out all the males. Um, and again, you want a very wide space. And you look at that picture there, and it almost looks like he's standing in front of some Christmas trees. And with that, those are, that's one type of uh, CBD variety hemp. Sometimes they're, they're you know, more tall and skinny, but a lot of them are more bushy with that. So why is pollination a big deal? Uh, cannabis, any kind of cannabis, is what they call dioecious. That just means it's like us. There's a male and a female part. Like they don't have the same, for the most part, they don't have the same uh, in one plant, they don't have male and female. So that means that you want the females, but the males that are producing pollen, those aren't any good to you because they don't have any 
we're not going to produce any flowers. And so if you do have uh, pollination occurring, and the males will uh, produce pollen for you know, two to four weeks, like you can see in that picture over there, uh, again, that pollen can be carried hundreds of miles, but again, generally within the first three to 10 miles is when you'll have that. So again, what's the point here? Pollination of those females brings down the cannabinoid production. It doesn't make it zero, but it does reduce the cannabinoid production. So if you do have what they call pollen contamination, let's say you've got a, seed, uh, a field of CBD hemp and your neighbor has uh, the grain. And so he's gonna have a lot of males, a lot of pollen flying around. Uh, there's gonna be some issue of, you'll hear words like ruining crop. Uh, and there definitely is a need for research to know just how uh, how far the pollen travels under different you know, climatic conditions, wind and all that, but also uh, just how much that cannabinoid production goes down. So there's definitely a need for that. But in general, if you hear people talking about pollen contamination, that's what they're talking about. Uh, soil fertility, again, pretty similar to our main row crops. There isn't, if you were to send your soil sample into MSU labs, they don't have a a uh, hemp specific set of recommendations, but we use winter wheat as a pretty good proxy for phosphorus and potassium, and for nitrogen, uh, pretty similar to what you would find for some levels of corn. Some, some corn growers would use a lot more. Uh, for pest management, this is really easy because we really don't have a lot of options. So as you can see in the fold here, there are no herbicides, Schedule 3 herbicides, that are labeled for hemp use. And so weed control in hemp is a huge deal, right? uh, particularly for CBD production, but it can also be true <coughs> depending on your, uh, your grain and uh, fiber field if you don't have a dense enough. Uh, the FDA, or excuse me, the EPA, just at the end of 2019, they did approve a list of 10 pesticides that can legally be used now in hemp. Uh, but it turns out most of those are uh, biopesticides. Uh, so there's going to be some activity as an insecticide or fungicide, uh, but, but uh, limited activity. Uh, for fiber, if you're going to be uh, producing for fiber, the, uh, the harvest is essentially similar to what you would use for hay, uh, somewhat similar type of limit. So you'll cut it when it's green, like you see in the picture, and then you'll leave it lay in the field to rot or to rot, basically microbes to break down that fiber, or at least start to break it down. So really what you want is the inside, the outside, those, those uh, herd and those past fibers to separate a little bit so that it makes processing a little bit easier. And then it can be bailed up, stored, and then processed later. For grain, uh, you can use equipment like this, and this is, uh, this is a grain head on combine that most farmers would have. Uh, you can you know, do some modifications and do what they're doing here, and they're actually doing a two-pass system where they're, they're harvesting the grain off the top, and then they'll come back and they'll get the, the fiber, so it'll get a, a dual purpose. Uh, when you are harvesting, since hemp is what they call a, a non-determinant plant, that uh, means it's going to you know, produce seed over time, only about 75% of the seed will be mature, and so when you harvest, you'll then need to separate out the immature seed using a gravity table or something similar. You definitely want to get the seed into a dryer uh, within a few hours. Uh, it's, it's relatively moist and mold will start to set in relatively quickly. Uh, conventional combine, again, can be used like you saw in that little video, uh, but there are some, some specialty made equipment where you can do all of what I just described in the same pass. So just as an FYI, again, uh, the males, once they have pollinated, they'll die. And for grain production, that's just wasted space. Okay, so you can kind of see those brown plants, though. Those are, those are males. And so roughly half of the hemp plants in a grain field will be dead and won't be producing grain for them. Um, one benefit from hemp, a lot of people talk about the, the soil properties or, or how it can be beneficial for, for, uh, for soil organic matter or for loosening up the soil. So this taproot that you see here uh, can be as deep as six feet. Um, and that's, that's a big deal for a couple of different reasons. Number one, it tends to loosen the soil. So there are certain types of, types of cover crop that can do the same thing. They sort of break up the soil.
soil as the roots grow down into it. Uh, but it can also retrieve water from deeper, from below a typical root zone, and also nutrients that may have leached down below the root zone. Lastly, I'll just refer briefly to what MSU did with hemp last year. So 2019 was the first year that MSU did anything with hemp. We weren't able to do any research on it before 2019. And all that they did on campus was look at seed and fiber varieties. They didn't do any research with CBD varieties. We had plots up in UP at one of our research stations, and then here in Lansing on campus. This just gives you a real general sense of, uh, it was primarily a variety trial that was done in conjunction with a number of other uh, land-grant universities from around the country. And you can see they looked at a bunch of different varieties and took a lot of data. And not just the yield, but also some other components. Because really what they wanted to know is what would be the best uh, grain and fiber varieties for use here in Michigan. Uh, one researcher, one of our weed scientists on campus, did do some herbicide screening. Uh, she sprayed, in this case, those are pre-emergent. In other words, those herbicides would keep weeds from emerging. And then some post-emergent, so once the weeds are out there, they would spray over the top to kill those weeds. And she just did some efficacy trials and was looking for uh, which herbicides would be able to control weeds without actually hurting the hemp. So for example, this large one on the right hand side, uh, Stinger, that's a herbicide that would be used for broad leaf crops or broad leaf weeds. And since hemp is a broad leaf plant, um, you can expect it to be injurious and you can see that it was. So she gathered some data for an initial screen and then she'll continue that in this coming. We also had our uh, uh, field crop entomologists and pathologists out there doing some scouting, trying to figure out the insects that are going to be problematic here in Michigan. We didn't have a lot of it growing this past year, uh, but we can assume that once acreages ramp up, some of those disease and insect issues will, will also have higher pest pressures. Lastly, anything you want to know about what MSU is doing with hemp, uh, you can go to this website here. It's sort of built it as a one-stop shop. So if you want to find out research, um, the, the latest results, uh, there'll be something there. Any articles, there are a number of webinar recordings. So anything that you find on there is downloadable for free. So that is what you want to go to if you want to know what kind of students do. So they will replicate everything that they did in 2019 and 2020. And as of right now, uh, I was told that we're not planning on doing any work with CBD and then hopefully we'll be able to start working with it moving forward. So, right, that's all I have. So, we're not taking questions. We'll just stay for that. Workshops are one to two days. There's a lot of information. We hope to have a resource page on our website up and running soon um, with all this information on it, though. So that would be a one stop shopping place for you to go for information. Next up, we're going to have um, some testing, sampling, and scientific information from. Impact Analytical. Impact Analytical is right here in Midland, out on uh, Virginia Drive. And they're gonna talk a little bit about the, maybe the issues that they're having, um, what they do when they test, and I'm just gonna leave it up to them. I don't know if you guys wanna, okay. speaking for Impact in Analytical is going to be Neil Chapman. He's the president.
Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Neil Chapman. I'm the president of Impact Download. Hemp testing in North America right now, there are only 31 laboratories, independent laboratories, that are actually approved to do the testing. Fortunately, two of those are actually based in Michigan, and one of them is here in the middle. Uh, many of you, if you are from this town, uh, as you can tell, I'm not. Uh, Impact Analytica was part of the Michigan Molecular Institute, which was housed just down the road in a, in a building about 100 yards away from here. Um, but a couple of years ago, we moved out to, to Stark Road so that we could expand our business. We're kind of unique in that we are an FDA and EPA compliant testing facility, which means we handle a lot of drug testing. Uh, and that's not sort of pre-employment drugs, that's drugs that are being developed, new drugs. But to get that, you have to be DEA approved. So we have a DEA license, which means we can receive controlled substances. <coughs> we currently have about 750 clients globally. But uh, this has become a new focus for us, is, is working with the USDA on the hemp market. We're only talking briefly here. Uh, again, there are three of us. Uh, we'll be available to answer any questions you may have after. Um, but the rules are pretty specific, although fluid. Uh, and I was listening to Gina, and, and it was quite interesting that I had a phone call with the USDA only two days ago. And I said, well, who's going to do the sampling? For, for all of these products. And they said, well, as long as it's not the farmer, we don't really care. Well, that's not what the rules say. Um, so it, it's still a very fluid situation. Um, but as Liz was correctly stated, you do have to have a plan that's very well documented for this. They did state federal, local, or tribal uh, representatives would need to do the sampling. Uh, and it did have to be done within 15 days of the expected harvest. And, uh, the 15 day window was to allow for any weather or equipment related issues. Uh, but I asked them as well, okay, so what's a batch? If someone's going to test a batch of hemp, what does that look like? And again, the response was, well, it depends. Uh, if you've got 10 one acre fields, you could sample 10, put them together as a composite, test them once. The problem is, if they're off spec, you lose all 10 fields. Or, you submit 10 one-acre batches, which means your testing price is going to be increased. But if one of those fields is off, you only lose one acre. So these are the rules that aren't clearly defined yet with the USDA, but they're, they're in progress at the moment. To do that testing, this is the sort of equipment you need. This is called a time-of-flight mass spec liquid chromatography. It's an awful lot of wording which says that we inject a bit of liquid into a column and we push it through with other liquids and we separate it. Um, but that little toy there is about $400,000 and we have to have two of them because you have to be able to duplicate and have a backup. So there's two of those located at our lab on, on Star Road. What does it give you for that? This is it, it's called a chromatogram. And in this particular model here you can see all of the different cannabinoid compounds that we can detect. Uh, but when you really look at the interesting part, it's here. This is your THC. And this is actually detected at a level of 10 parts per million. Each of those peaks is, a, is 10 parts per million. So we can see very, very low levels of, of all of these compounds, although typically um, we need to be able to see at a much higher level. But there is a process that we go through now for people to request work, request samples, uh, and I'm going to let Dina Conrad Vlasic from my business development group talk a little bit on that. Okay. Drag it over and speak, or shout, you can shout at me. Right? Alright, so basically how it would work is you need, we need a quote request. So you could call us, you could go to our website and say, you know what, I'm interested in some <coughs> testing. Once we get a quote request, in about a day to two days, we turn around a quote with pricing, so we'll need to know how many samples you're interested in having tested. So you get a quote back with the pricing. If you accept the quote, then we go to the sampling, which as uh, Mr. Chapman mentioned, is still kind of up in the air. 
Uh, we've been working with the local agencies to determine how we're going to sample and get the material to impact for testing. Once it's in the lab, uh, it takes us approximately five days to do the processing and collect the data. After the data is collected, it's about 24 hours or another day to get a final report. So overall, you can do your testing in about six days. Uh, I guess that's the basic process. Are there any questions? The key with the testing is that we have to show the, the range of the value, which is basically the range of the test's ability to be accurate. Which could mean that you have a, a result of 0.31, which technically is off spec, but if the range of the analysis is from 0.28 to 0.33, then it would be on spec. Plus, as I mentioned earlier, you, you are allowed to, to do retesting on this uh, to see if it falls in the specification. So that's it. I just uh, want to give a quick overview of the analytical portion. Um, if you do have any questions, as myself, as Dina, and Farad, who is my VP of Operations, will be here to answer any questions you may have. So next, we're going to talk with our farmer grower producer panel, which includes Star Farm Alliance, <coughs> Hampshire, Ag Marbles, Mike Klump in his left well, oh, that's probably, sorry, and Craig, is it Wigland? Wigland? Wigand, sorry. He is join us, joining us via Skype. We're going to get him in here. And then we have Joe Brown with Brown Hemp Incorporated. So what we're going to do maybe is have each of you kind of give us an idea, you know, a little overview of what you've learned, uh, what you do, and spark some questions in us. So Randy, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, Randy Hampshire. Uh, a little more than a year ago, my brother, who was in Denver, and I uh, started a company. And being in Denver, you know, there's a lot of experience there. I've been there actually four times now. Uh, we decided to start a company with a two-year business plan, which is a really good deal because the learning curve was really quite high this first year. Uh, I've been a certified organic grower on our couple hundred acres in Kingston, which is in Tuscola County, uh, since 1988. And I'm a very diversified farm. We have a wood fire brick oven bakery. We have a raw milk cow share. We do a couple of farmers markets, Eastern Market in Detroit and Royal Oak, which is just a little ways north of there. So I have a lot of experience in uh, diversity. So uh, it uh, started out, you know, just getting some seed. We did uh, 25 acres all together. We had to replant 10 acres of it. The seed that we got was uh, did not have a very good germination. Of course, I didn't know that because, you know, as Gina said, the program didn't start hardly get started until April. That already was late to get started as a farmer. So we were not planting until June and some of it even into July. But we had 25 acres. We planted 10 acres of it. I thought it was me, but come to find out, you know, our plants did, just didn't come up. I thought it was what I was doing or something. And uh, we finally did end up with a pretty good crop on some of it because replanting, we replanted some by hand. Uh, we did three different varieties and we did a lot of different test plots. Some of, <clears throat> some of it was put in 15 inch rows, some of it was in uh, five foot rows, four feet apart on uh, black plastic with drip irrigation. Some of it was open pollinated where we had other people close by. Our farms were separated by 25 miles, so we had people that were growing grain and so that would pollinated us, so we moved our, our, uh, our uh, feminized seed 25 miles away to our home farm, 
and we put that all on black plastic and drip irrigation. For some of those we didn't irrigate uh, just so we could see how it, it, it acted. Uh, one of the neat things of having an old farm, I did find some information from growing hemp from years and years ago. I found a, a book that uh, had three pages about hemp from back in the 1880s. My, I think it was one of my great grandfather's books. I picked up something in there that you know it does have a taproot. Well, and then that's really kind of being a taproot. If you were using uh, clones or transplants, and you do. You know, black plastic, it really doesn't have that much of a taproot, but it does have a taproot if you grow the plant, the cannabis plant, from seed. So I thought, hmm, uh, you know, we're already, uh, you know, April, and if we've got a hard subsoil, maybe I'd better do some subsoiling. Some of the guys that uh, didn't subsoil in the spring did have some problems, their plants just didn't grow. That taproot needs to go down. So that was a good thing that we did. We subsoiled all of our 25 acres before we grew. Um, we did a lot of testing, just trying to find out what the plant was doing. I mean, there is so many things. I mean, a year ago, a little better than a year ago, I didn't know anything about this. And I feel pretty confident going into our second year, we know where we're going. So we had, our company, we started to help other growers. We had probably a handful of other growers. With our 25 acres, we might have had almost a combination of uh, 100 acres all together from Ann Arbor to the tip of the thumb. One of the guys in Ann Arbor actually grew some with different seed varieties, and we did harvest some seed. I used an edible bean combine. It worked really well. I haven't cleaned it up yet, but we hope to have some of that for sale. Uh, a week and a half ago, we actually delivered a small two, two totes of our flour to California. We're going to have it made into cigarettes, clone, uh, cones, and have vaporizers available for people that we hope to retail to. And I hope to be able to market from uh, the other growers that we worked with this year. And I'm starting to talk with a few additional growers for the up and coming year next year but the only people we will work with will be certified organic growers and one of the reasons is we did test our uh, crop for roundup and i'm hoping that some of the other labs will start testing for roundup i had a hard time finding a lab that would even test for it i sent our product away to california it was a 265 sixty-five dollar test just to get tested for one herbicide but i think it's one of the most widely used herbicides so I think it's something that our end user would like to see that it is Roundup free. And I don't think many farmers could pass that because it's uh, used so widely. And one of the reasons why we're, we decided to go instead of with oil and biomass, we thought that's what we do in the beginning, but we didn't have a lot of plants anyway. We did some hand harvesting, har harvested the flower because it will be used that way in the, it, it'll be used as, a, as the flower direct to the end user in the cigarette and the cone. And those chemicals are passed through right into the end user. So you need to have, you know, a clean product. We'll have a C of A, a certificate of analysis that will test for uh, biologicals, all the herbicides, pesticides, and you know we've already done the, the Roundup test, but once we get our sample together, it's now in California, they get it all blended, put together, we'll do one test. So that will get put on our package and we'll have a, a quick response uh, uh, item on our package so that the end user can look and see what we have on our product. So, um, I'll probably make our phone number available for uh, uh, Star Farm Alliance uh, for later on. So if anybody is a certified organic grower, you want to get a hold of us, you want some help growing, I feel pretty confident we can help people grow. It's been, I've, you know, I didn't know a lot about this plant when we first started, but uh, I have a tremendous respect for the plant. Uh, I, I've been, you know, like I said, to Denver now four times in the last year and uh, uh, learned a lot. It's, it's been a pretty, a pretty wild ride and kind of fun. So, thank you.
<clears throat> now we're going to go ahead and talk to uh, Mike Kohn talk. He is at Marbles with uh, he's in Isabella County, correct? Okay, I'm just going to let you take over that microphone and tell us what you've learned and what you do. Okay. Yeah, Mike Clump with Ag Marbles. We're located in the Shepherd area. Um, we have about a 3,000 acre uh, certified organic farm as well uh, over here. And been doing that for the last, um, been certified for eight, eight or 10 years now, somewhere in there. So uh, we also grew our hemp, uh, grew hemp on our own farm. Certified organic. Um, we got into this all the same time everybody else did. Um, I think here, you know, late, uh, late spring, we ended up helping a lot of other farmers as well, um, sourcing some seed, uh, propagating some starts and things for them in the spring, um, and then uh, ultimately seeing the need out there for um, drying and processing and that kind of stuff that just was not being built. So, so we kind of jumped in with both feet. Um, we built a drying facility last fall, um, helped several farmers in the state to uh, dry. Uh, we did a lot of melon for them, uh, drying, uh, we leased uh, a lot of square footage to do hang drying as well. The guys are going for whole flower and stuff, so we hung dry a lot of plants. And then we uh, we ultimately built an extraction facility over there as well. So now we're we're up and going. We have an ethanol extraction facility uh, in Shepherd, uh, where we're we're extracting down to uh, crude oil on a rather large basis, but uh, still looking to scale that um, here right now too. We do have small scale. Uh, distillation and isolate production, but um, uh, large scale, both of those are getting ready to be put in. So now we're, uh, we've kind of positioned ourselves. We, we've seen a big problem this year um, with genetics in Michigan. Um, we got a lot of really bad genetics. A lot of people bought feminized seed that was not feminized seed. Um, a lot of hot samples coming in well over the 0.3 THC limit. So we really went out and tried to source some good seed. And I think we did that, spent a lot of time and dollars um, trying to run down good seed. Um, so that's something that, uh, that we're helping to offer this year is seed and starts for people, um, along with some fertilizer blends and other things where we're just trying to be that complete, uh, uh, complete seed to seal company. And, and again, kind of the same thing, work with some growers here in Michigan that, that want to work with us. Um, we've also come up with a couple brands of our own uh, so we do have some retail brands uh, on the shelf as well. Um, uh, Heirloom Grove is the name of one of them. We have um, finished products of uh, uh, muscle freezes and bath bombs, body salts, uh, lotions, tinctures, uh, all sorts of things that were, were out of the market uh, uh, selling as well. So we're, we're literally uh, involved in this thing from, you know, from seed to sale and, and uh, looking to team up with some more growers and stuff for the 2020 season and keep moving things forward, so. All right, so next we have another Michigan person, Joe Brown, Senior Project Manager of Brown Hemp Company. He also is uh, the co-founder of the Michigan Hemp Farmer Association. Kind of a new thing, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, so tell us a little bit about what you learned and what you know. All right, so uh, I am the oldest processor for hemp in the state, uh, receiving a uh, 7606 uh, permit for research uh, in 2014. And uh, I got a license in Kentucky to farm hemp, and then we got a processing license in Burtonley in Michigan through MDARD. Uh, and, uh, before everybody else was cut off, we, uh, we were allowed to uh, be able to do that. But some very strict uh, rules when uh, MDAR gave us the food license, processing license. Uh, some of the things that they made us do at that time, we still do today, uh, it's food processing license. Although we were growing the hemp with uh, the permission of the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, when we imported that hemp into the state of Michigan, and uh, turned it into an end user product, they were very, very strict. And Dard said, look it, this is a food product. That means there's no milligrams that are going on this package, period, no milligrams. It's also a food product, so that means it's not gross. It's not generally recognized as safe. So uh, don't put it in food products. So it kind of limited us to what we could do. I, 
I left some uh, of some of the first legal products that were ever made from hemp under an MDARD and Kentucky Department of Agriculture license out there on that table out there if you want to see them. They're historical. And so they're the first ones, 2014. Um, we had to self police. We had to listen very clearly to MDARD. Uh, so that we can continue to do the things that we were being allowed to do. Uh, Mr. Snyder, our former governor, uh, was very gracious, him and uh, the former attorney general, to let, allow us to do this. Uh, was not, was not, everyone did not get to do this. Uh, uh, prior to getting that 7606 permit, we had incorporated uh, a hemp company uh, in 2009 under the protections of the medical marijuana act. So we really started in 2009, we were growing uh, what was allowed uh, under the Medical Marijuana Act, uh, growing industrial hemp and doing trials and making CBD products before anybody knew what CBD products were. My, my, my colleague Thomas over here, his uh, business partner, Matt Abel, who was the head of Normal, sat me down 10 years ago and he said, Joe, why are you, what is up with this hemp stuff, this CBD stuff? Why would anybody buy it? It doesn't get you stoned. And I kind of chuckled and I, and I said, you know what? Matt, I said, you watch. In the next 10 to 15 years, CBD is going to be the biggest thing going. And I was right. I was right about that. Um, so I've owned a bunch of different companies. I've owned businesses with Tommy Chong. I've owned businesses with gold medalists, uh, Ross Robilotti. Uh, we've sold globally. We've sold nationally. Uh, we had banking and checking accounts when nobody in the industry had them. I mean, we've done a lot of first things first. Uh, a lot, a lot of things learned. Um, I recently sold one of my brands, and uh, I'm not retired, but semi-retired now. So we decided there was, like Mike said, there were so many bad genetics going around last year. I mean, it just made your head spin. I couldn't believe the dishonest, crooked stuff that was going on. Uh, it, problems with mycotoxins. I've talked to Gina about that. People selling smokable hemp and not testing for mycotoxins under 10,000 uh, CFU. I'm gonna, I mean, I'm the mycotoxin guy. You're gonna hear me advocate for that over and over again. You should not be smoking smokable hemp and it's got more than 10,000 CFU with mycotoxins. It's just not a good thing. Um, heavy metals, you brought up the heavy metals. It's crazy, all these samples people would send us, all hot for heavy metals and mycotoxins. I couldn't believe it. They're selling smokable on the market right now. And I'm not the hemp police, so uh, I, I'm not gonna buy the product. And we tell our friends and family, don't buy that. It's not a good product. It's, you know, make sure you're, what you're putting in your body is good for you. This is supposed to be a health product, right? CBD is healthy, and we're selling something that's healthy that is harmful for people. Come on, that's putting profits over personal well-being. We're we're a faith-based organization. We're never going to condone that. You're never going to get that from me ever or our members. Um, so. The Michigan Hemp Farmer Association was made because we have all these farmers calling us, saying, looking for answers. They want to know this, they want to know that. And I was charging $55 an hour for consulting fees, and we did quite well with it. And uh, my son said, you know what, Dad, we, we need to get an organization because there's not an organization out there that are answering these questions for free. How, what can we do, Dad? And I says, uh, well, let's start an association, make a $50 yearly uh, a fee to pay for gas and lights and electricity, and let's have three uh, free clinics for our members and show them from beginning to end how to do this stuff and be successful at it and not get burned. I mean, I, I feel terrible. My grandpa and grandma were farmers for years, and, uh, and I see all these other farmers losing their tail on this stuff and just disgust me. So we started the Michigan Hemp Farmer Association. So tonight, I just want to tell you three things that uh, that you should know if you're going to get in this business. And, uh, and I'll elaborate a little bit on each one. But the first thing, if you're going to do hemp, in my opinion, is you find a buyer and uh, you secure the sale of your hemp with a trusted company or have a solid plan on how you're going to sell your hemp. Don't go grow 10 acres of hemp if you ain't got no one to buy it because there ain't nobody buying it. It's just, it's a, that's not a smart move. Uh, have a plan in place. Don't go start planning stuff thinking that it, they're the booms here and you're going you're gonna to cash in on it. That's dangerous. Nobody does that. Don't do that. Uh, 
Second thing, secure viable and trusted seed. Mike was talking about it. This gentleman was talking about it. These guys are out here. They'll tell you. They'll show you the COA and they'll say, oh, this is Colorado or California. It's been tried over and over. Look at these numbers. 20% CBD. Look at the uh, MGARD list on the percentages. It's online. They're not in 20% range. None of these cultivars are. They're all tied 10%. I'm on that list. The stuff we grew is 10%. Yeah, that's your, probably your max right now, I would say. With that about right, Gina, 10%? So when you hear these guys pitching 20% and all this, shh, get away from them. Run. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh, I'll tell you something we recommend our members to do. When someone you want to buy seed from them, have them give you three references of three farmers who grew that cultivar. And get their phone numbers and call them and talk to them and get their COAs and, and do your due, due, due diligence to make sure what they're selling you is really not snake oil. Uh, another thing, third thing, uh, me and the doctor were talking about it. You're going to grow, you, you've, you've, uh, you, you know we're going to sell it, uh, you know you got good seeds or good clones. Uh, the third thing you do before you buy all that stuff and start tilling and plowing, get a soil test. Make sure, like this gentleman said, that all that Roundup that you were using and per your grandpa was using and your dad and whoever else, whatever they were putting in the field, isn't going to make your hemp hot for heavy metals uh, and herbicides when uh, when, you, when your plant is uh, done growing. Uh, uh, hemp and marijuana, they're... Uh, Hyperaculators, you know, they suck up all that poison, all that stuff goes into the plant, and then you're going to have an end product, and you're going to ingest that. I, I don't recommend you do that. Uh, there should, I'm going to advocate for that through the Michigan Farm Hemp Farm Association, is to make mandatory mycotoxin testing and have heavy metals. We issued it to the USDA in our letter, uh, in our recommendations. That's one of the things we asked for that that be mandatory, affordable mandatory testing. Affordable, not crazy numbers. I, mean, I know what you're talking about. We go, we do our due diligence like you do, sir. And some of the testing is just so expensive. Uh, and we do variety trials. This year we'll grow seven different kinds. Last year we, we grew, I think, four, four different kinds. And uh, uh, it gets expensive when we start testing everything. So you want to make it affordable, especially if you're a small farm like we are. Um, oh, let me. Uh, let me say this too. Uh, so, if you're interested in the Michigan Hemp Farmer Association, um, you know we're, we're we're farmers. We've been doing, most of our advisory panel has been doing this 10 to 20 years. Uh, some of the guys on our advisory panel have been growing in Europe. Uh, some of my mentors are growing in Europe and California. And, uh, they they do this. They have farms and. They're, they're not lawyers or politicians or whatever, you know, uh, they're actual hands-on uh, farmers for now. Um, and we want to help you guys. We want everyone to be successful. We're going to have a uh, top 10 things you must know to successfully farm out on uh, March 7th in Lowell, Michigan. You can go to www.michiganhempfarmerassociation.com uh, to attend that. And uh, I, I think anybody would uh, benefit from um, with that being said, uh, I, uh, I can go on forever, uh, but thank you for letting me speak, and uh, I hope everybody has a, success, a very successful season. Thank you. All right, next on the screen, we have Craig Wigand, Wigand, sorry, all the way from Oregon going to talk about what they've learned and what they know about hemp farming in Oregon. Hello there. Uh, I'm just uh, going to speak a little bit briefly about my experiences and give a little uh, grower perspective on the industry. Is that my coming in all right? I'm clear. Okay. Well, Oregon, we had 60,000 acres registered to, to plant um, this spring. I think 30,000 acres were successfully planted and maybe 15,000 acres successfully harvested. So it finished pretty, pretty dramatically all the way through the season and echoed uh, some of what 
these farmers have already reiterated is genetics are key to a successful season. On F1 genetics, which are going to have similar phenotypes, they're going to mature at the same dates, they won't have multiple characteristics in the field, and uh, hopefully the similar seed company. Uh, all good, just briefly, from start to finish. Um, in Oregon, we start planting, starts the beginning of May, takes three weeks in the greenhouse, you need 60 degrees uh, soil temperatures to drink and seed. Um, you can have that process higher than it usually is 25 cents a seed down to 14. So that's the average, at least in Oregon. I recommend a 72 tray in a 20 by 10 um, tray size, you got 72 cells, 72 seeds. Um, you can also do one forty fours, which I, um, I planted in 2000 seed this spring, one forty fours, and it's successful. Uh, nutrition, or echoing another back to what everybody said, you just you can test your soil. Um, a chemical residue test is expensive. They'll be a thousand bucks to do 350 different pesticides, pesticides, fungicides. That is or don't do yourself in the, in the beginning. Um, and just a general soil test will cost 50 to 75 dollars. Um, most important part of a soil test, I would say, with him uh, is pH. The parameters I would say six two to six point nine is your probably best pH um, conditions for him. There's really not a lot of studies not and if you look get on Google and your research and find out what hemp needs, most of it's gonna be pertinent to uh harvest. So you're not gonna find a lot of C B D essential oil um, information out there. Uh, in general, depending on plant population. Which is depending on what you choose to do. I planted anywhere from 16 to 2,000 plants to the acre. So you take the rows that you see, six foot centimeters, or down the row is 24 feet, we apply that by 40, 45, 60. And that will give you a rough idea of how many seeds you're going to plant. Um, nitrogen use. Be 150 pounds, phosphorus 40 to 60, and, and potassium. You're not going to get toxic with that potassium with him, so you need to be 200 is fine, 2 to 250, 250 pounds. Um, plastic, I highly recommend for your first year. It uh, is forgiving, it allows you to use very little water. I use one inch every nine days. Um, this year I won't be using plastic, I'll be strip tilling through grass sod. I'm trying to cut down my costs. Uh, that's, I think, going to be my standard going forward. Um, other than that, I think, yeah, the, the problems with hemp is it's problems of occur and then they grow exponentially it's not literally it's a five month growing season and the costs rack up so um, echoing what other people said have outlets have buyers whether it's in the flower market um, or the oil market uh, a good rule of thumb is for 10 percent biomass 40 pounds will give you one liter of distillate that's a rough estimate, so you can kind of crunch some numbers that way, but you still need to have control of where you sell your oil to. But I think that's about all I got. three to five years, it's going to be pretty much a test <laughs> until they get it figured out. Um, next, we're going to hear from Steve Scott. He is the owner of Kraft Hemp Company. 
and he also has Ungrown Ideas, which is a consulting firm for people. Um, he is our expert on the products. Uh, Jamie, Mike's wife, is going to join us tonight, but had a sick child, so um, maybe Mike could kind of share some of what Jamie does too. So we'll let Steve talk first, and thank you. Hello everyone, thanks for coming tonight. I'm um, Steve Scott. I have the local CBD shop here in Midland called Craft Town Company. Uh, I think within the Great Lakes Bay region, I'm probably the only CBD shop that focuses on education first and then CBD. Uh, basically, I worked in the cannabis industry professionally for five years now. Uh, jumped out of the corporate world, good, good paying job to get in the crazy rat race with cannabis. The uh, reason is, is when I was 24 years old, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer after graduating college. Uh, cannabis, before that, was a recreational thing we had fun with. Um, after, when I was going through chemo, I found it to actually be a medicine. And um, once I full circled back into Michigan, moving away from years, uh, I decided to retire from the corporate world and go full tilt. And one of my first things I picked up was CBD consulting for pets. Uh, I was able to help my dog with two blown ACLs heal back up. They blew within two weeks of each other, and that's when I was like, oh wow, this hemp stuff is like really good, you know, like THC and the CBD. This, now this is awesome. Um, took me a minute to convince my wife, who's a physician, on the medical properties of CBD, but once she was able to see it firsthand with her anxiety, um, was kind of put a light bulb in my head that this is like, where I really want to focus in the cannabis industry. Um, so I have done everything and everything to learn about CBD, hemp, other cannabinoids. Um, started off doing consults with patients that came into my place that wanted to know about medical marijuana. When they would get a card and go into a dispensary and a kid would recommend a 30% THC strain to them and, or an edible that's 100 milligrams and would do nothing but get them paranoid and never want to try cannabis again. When in actuality, these people could start off with CBD and work their way into a ratio of medical marijuana later if it didn't work. Um, so that's kind of where I had a dream one night that I have all this knowledge and family videos selling CBD and so is a local gas station. So why should I not bring like be the real deal and like bring education first? So that's where my store is. We do one-on-one -on -one consults with people we work with the hemp farmers to get to know them, like Mike, Joe, I know these guys before we come in, we've talked. Um, my store focuses, if I can have Michigan brands, I have it probably about 80% of the stuff in my store is Michigan hemp CBD, um, and then everything else is like craft brands that I find from around the country. Uh, they have to be fed in before we bring them in. Um, I am also, you know, very popular with the 80 year old crowd here in Midland, so, you know, topicals that are loving that in relief. We carry uh, uh, Heirloom Grove in my store, um, so it's really good to support local farmers and be able to have people come in and ask questions about it and, and get educated. I think that's like the biggest focus. With CBD, and I'm really excited, to, honestly, to tell you the truth, uh, to see CBG and CBD <coughs> come down, other cannabinoids that we can produce through hemp, especially I feel, um, in the next year or two that these farmers are going to get burnt on the THC levels and they're going to switch to the hemp that's really heavy at CB, uh, CBG. So I, I, that's, that's something for you guys to look into too. I think Mike, Joe, and them probably are on the same research looking into this, but uh, if you guys have any questions about CBD, CBD products, or whatever it is, I'd be a person to come to, feel free to. Uh, we have a passion for it. If you want to come in to a little shop, say hi. Check it out. Uh, don't be afraid. We're just here to help people get quality of life and you know get healthy, not high. So. I really don't have much to add to that. Steve's uh, kind of got the full blown deal, but he does carry some of our products uh, in his store, the Heirloom Grove brand, that um, uh, essentially my wife's brand. So I can't. Uh, I can't tell you much more than Steve really has. I don't know if you want to you know, open it up to questions. Are there any questions as far as this stuff goes? Or do you... Well, we're, we got one more speaker, so we'll go ahead and have, we have Thomas Levine from the Cannabis Council tonight. 
He's going to talk to us about what he has learned and what he knows about the laws and the regulations and the problems maybe that some people are having. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Attorney Thomas Levine. I'm with the law firm of Cannabis Council. I'm a longtime activist in cannabis. Um, I've been involved in the petition drives going back years before we finally got it done this time around. But I was on the board of directors to get it uh, passed this time. Now, interestingly enough, the same act that legalized adult use marijuana here in Michigan, where everyone now, 21 or older, can grow up to 12 plants um, at their home and, and keep the entire harvest, plus 10 ounces that they may have uh, been gifted elsewhere. It all has to be kept under lock and key in a locked closet, anything over two and a half ounces. Um, so that's the law right now for uh, the state of Michigan. Um, but in that same petition that got voted in by the voters, um, industrial hemp was also legalized. Now, shortly after that became effective, that became effective December 6th, um, during the lame duck session, the legislature did pass the bills that are in place right now um, legalizing industrial hemp as well. And it, it's a good thing. And Governor Whitmer did a good job in getting us started um, under the 2014 Act, because we did already have that law in place, because the federal government did not have their regulations done yet. And so rather than having to wait um, another year, um, Michigan was able to get uh, a crop in last year, um, so that worked out. But the, the, um, the laws that are in place in Michigan, I think we have the best law and cannabis in the country um, across the board for the medical marijuana as well as for the adult use and the industrial hemp. In every other state in the country, if the industrial hemp tests for over 0.3% THC, it all must be destroyed. But under Michigan's law, that can be transferred to a medical marijuana facilities license holder of processing. So somebody holding a processing license under the Michigan Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act that's in place right now. Um, there are suppliers to the provisioning centers that are the retail stores that are open right now servicing our patients and caregivers in the state. And now, um, as of November 1st um, of 2019, the state began accepting applications for the adult use commercial licenses as well. Um, so we have uh, several different acts that all apply to cannabis in this state. Um, patients and caregivers can still remain growing their 12 plants and that act hasn't gone anywhere, although the commercial licenses have come out. Now, the, I'm, I'm angered at the fact that whenever you see news articles still, they're still talking about smoking marijuana, you know. They're still talking about the recreational aspect, you know. There's, of course, there's been more shows on the medical part, and that's all been positive. But why not enough about industrial hemp? That's what really excites me. The product development opportunities here, the way I look at it, we live in a petroleum-based product economy, and this could... Um, basically transition to more of a hemp-based product economy. And the industrial hemp has the biodegradability and, and properties that um, just make all kinds of sense instead of digging up oil um, and, and polluting the world, we can replant hemp. It's a renewable natural resource. It's a no-brainer um, that hemp fuel is a big opportunity. The food 
is extraordinary with the omega six and three ratio is ideal. Um, and of course, the whole variety of plastics. I practiced law in Hawaii for five years and the islands of plastic that float in our oceans is a crime against humanity. Had that been made out of industrial hemp for the last hundred years, we wouldn't be in this predicament. It would biodegrade. So the sooner the better that we get some product development going. You know, there's a lot of very talented product development people here at, at, at Dow. And, um, um, you know, that sort of rigor in terms of developing products and coming up with um, processes and, and entering into this brand new burgeoning economy. Um, it's, it's a very exciting time in our history and I think that um, it's going to do a lot of good for the world and create a lot of great jobs and, uh, and uh, I'm excited to meet everybody and, and, and learn from everybody's great information. Thanks. Does anybody have any questions for any of our panelists? I got a question for Tom. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, I got to ask you. So, are you saying that if our if my plot is hot, you're saying I can legally transfer that over to a medical marijuana facility? Yes, and one of the acts that was passed amended the Michigan Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act, so the processors says right in on that act as well, allowing the processors to receive it. So not only is it in the hemp law, but it's also in the MMFLA. So it's, it's an interesting. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, think, I think part of the problem is I think you're kind of crisscrossing between marijuana law and hemp law. Right now, uh, Public Act 641 has two different types of licenses, one of which is a processor handling license. So anybody who's processing industrial hemp has to have a processor handler license. Our law allows a marijuana licensed processor um, to process hemp. Um, it has to be compliant hemp without also having, having to have our license. So by per, the, per Public Act 641, you can't harvest your crop if it's hot, period. It has to be destroyed. It has to meet that 0.3%. So anything going into a processor should be compliant. So I think maybe maybe part of what you're describing is, I mean, I think we all recognize that as part of the processing process, as you're extracting CBD, you can end up with a THC concentrate that exceeds 0.3%. Again, by law, a hemp processor can only destroy it. They can't do anything with it per the hemp law. So um, if there's a marijuana, a licensed marijuana processor taking in compliant hemp and processing it, then they can presume, I don't know the marijuana laws, but that's where you kind of then get into what the marijuana laws allow and what they don't allow. I know that Lara is Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs is finishing up a rule set. I think they actually had public comment today. Um, they're finishing up a rule set which will help clarify what their licensed facilities are allowed to do with hemp. Uh, so that would include their labs, their provisioning centers, their um, processing facilities, and so. You know, the mer that, that kind of gets to what I mentioned on one of my slides where there are always going to be intersecting issues with the marijuana laws and it gets really confusing. Uh, bottom line with hemp, if you're growing hemp, it cannot even be harvested if it exceeds that 0.3% THC. So, you know, if it's, if, it's, if it's going the right way it's supposed to be going, <clears throat> the grower is having their crop tested, it's determined to be compliant, they harvest within 15 days per the law, and then they can send it to a processor for whatever purpose they want, and then at that point, 
uh, the processor, again, anything leaving a processing facility has to be compliant, 0.3% or less. And by law, that a processor, we recognize that a processor can be in possession of uh, concentrated THC that exceeds 0.3%, but by law, they can't do anything with it other than to destroy it. So that's where that helps kind of. I get a lot of questions on that. The reason I asked it, because I heard you say it, Tom, is because people call us all the time, and I, I take the call, I fill the calls, and they'll say, because we're a processing company, too, and they'll say, hey, my hemp's hot. I got a private test for the hemp, and it's hot. And I was told by my attorney that if you guys process it, you can lower the THC level out here, and that's legal. So uh, you're not the first time, it's not the first time I heard someone say it. But Gina's sitting here, I thought I'd just get some clarification, because I've been telling them what Gina says, which is, it's my understanding that if it doesn't meet the 0 0.3 and you don't get a certificate to harvest within 15 days, you have to destroy the crop. And that's, that was, that's what I tell people. I said, you know, you, you have your own, uh, you have to mitigate your own damages. I'm not a lawyer, um, but you know, that we won't accept that. We won't, we won't process that unless it has a certificate from the state of Michigan. So there are two different types of um, processor. Well, there's licensing that you can get to grow industrial hemp, or a grower processor manufacturing license, correct? Is there two different ones? Can you clarify that? Well, there's, so Public Act 641 actually has two different, I'll call them license types. Uh, you have to be registered as a grower if you are growing industrial hemp. That's a $100 license, which is renewable annually. Uh, the license expires at the end of November. And then there's also a processor handler license, which is required for any person who's processing, handling, brokering, or marketing industrial hemp, or an industrial hemp commodity or product. So only two different license types in Public Act 641. There are many more on the marijuana side, which again, we're not here to talk about marijuana, but uh, it, can, it can get confusing because there are licensed marijuana processors, licensed hemp processors, two different state agencies, two different laws. So as a private person, am I able to grow 12 plants of hemp in my backyard as I would cannabis? Only with a hundred dollar license, or excuse me, only with a hundred dollar registration. It's not a license. It's you have to be registered as a grower, regardless of how many. Our so lot doesn't have the same allowance months. as the marijuana laws. Again, another kind of confusing and kind of ridiculous um, comparison when you think about it, considering that hemp is legal and you have to be registered to grow any but on the marijuana <coughs> side, where it's still federally illegal, you can grow up to 12 plants recreationally. I know it's a little weird, but again, hemp, um, hemp has federal oversight. Marijuana does not, because it's not legal at the federal level. One, one thing to add there, um, it is actually federally legal criminally hemp is now. So that's a pretty huge change that that has occurred somewhat recently. It's off the Schedule 1 of the Controlled Substances Act. So that's really opened things up for hemp as opposed to cannabis still being on Schedule 1. That has a ripple effect of negative uh, consequences for taxes and several different areas. Uh, banking, for example interstate commerce, whereas since hemp is off that, it can have interstate commerce, banking, and um, it, it makes all the difference. Um, another conflict in the law here in Michigan is we have the laws that have been passed by the legislature and those rules that have been promulgated by MDARD carrying out those laws. <coughs> And Gina's right concerning those laws, and that's what's in place, and that's what um, you know we're kind of going by because we want to um, have a cooperative arrangement with the state. 
technically under, under the ballot initiative, it's much, uh, it's legal much more broadly, but that hasn't been litigated. We haven't really had to yet. And it's easy to get a license and um, through MDAR, um, but that conflict between the laws passed by the legislature and the ballot initiative haven't really been settled yet. I did want to add something. You're talking about it is very easy to get a license, yes, but I think what they're going to find out is you walk into bank around here and you tell them you're a hemp farmer or hemp anything, they're going to tell you no. Uh, that's locally right now. That is an issue, and that's one thing I'm hoping this industry would open up because federally they, Fed has come out and told the banking industry that being is okay and to do business with them, but you the banking industry, especially locally, credit unions, if you're trying to do anything with them around here, they're going to churn you away and act like you're, you're a marijuana business at the end of the day and direct you down to DARPA, Lids Bank, and in Detroit. So just should know that. Uh, maybe set up an LLC with a DBA on it if you are doing some stuff. We had a question on the audience. Yeah, I was just curious. What part of the plant is actually tested for the THC? Is it stem? It's the, the top flowering part, the pistolate part of the plant that we require be um, submitted by growers for sampling or for analysis. Let me, let me add to that. Uh, so we, we grow uh, 2,000, we grew 2,000 plants this year to test uh, different varieties. And we test, uh, we took a clipping off the top two inches of each plant. Uh, our plants were in 16 uh, pot uh, plots we call mini plots, and we take one sample from each plant, then we take all that material, we dry it all together, we grind it into a 50 micron powder, so it's one unit, and we test the whole unit at once. Now there's, uh, you, you could uh, do it differently, uh, you could jeopardize your, your whole crop, say it did hit hot, you know, and uh, you would want to test it differently the second time, you would want to do it all in one unit, but that's how we did it this year. We, we put it all, uh, took one off each plant, and then we knew what the overall <coughs> meaning of the entire crop was that way. Okay, along those lines then, if you say it does test, say it's just, it's over the 0.3%, and you get two more repeat testings, does additional growing potentially decrease the THC level? No, it does not. Then it, how does the repeat Testing. You, you would do uh, what MDARP recommended, which wouldn't be testing every plant. You would do a zigzag pattern, and I believe that's on your website. Um, and that's a, a, the most highly recommended way to do it because then uh, you're not going to put all your apples in one basket like I did. But we were real confident because we did consistent testing every week from the time they started flowering. We're a testing facility, we're not just a farm. Like we had a, a $100,000 contract to grow our account this year for a, a corporation to do testing with it. So we were able to, to, to work within those parameters and felt safe because we had done so much testing all the way through before we get it to MDAR. We, we kind of knew what the test results would be before they even came in. We, we were that tight on our testing. I think uh, somebody else who knows more about the actual agronomics can correct me if I'm wrong, but the THC levels are going to continue to rise as that plant stays in the ground. And I think the intent behind allowing a second and a third repeat sample really goes back to the potential for some variability even from one plant to another right next door. Right. So again, this, this more uh, homogenized sample where you're actually collecting from several plants in your plot, um, that is a better is is yeah. the better way to do it. That way, you don't run the risk of grabbing from one crazy plant that can be higher than its its you know its neighboring plants. You, you'll find when you grow. The, we I'll give you an example. We grew mammoth from Kentucky. It had had been certified here in Michigan. I mean, we hadn't grown it before this year, so it's our first run, but. By testing it every on a weekly basis, 
B knew exactly what it was. But here's the thing. From plot 1 to plot 45, plot 1 might have been 0.2, but plot 41 was 0.5. So it, it varies. I mean, you could actually be in plot 1 and have, out of those 16 plants, four of them test at 0.1, four test at 0.2, and the rest of them uh, test at point three. So you, you have to, it, it varies. It, it, it's, uh, it's, they're not stable genetics. It, it's so early in the game, uh, and mammoth is such an early cultivar now, that they, they're not stabilized yet. You have to be very careful about what you're growing. That's why we do the trials, and we get paid to do the trials, is so we can establish good genetics uh, that are safe and lower the risk factor for the farmer. And just for um, just one point, important point is so that repeat testing is in our state law right now. And once we have to be in compliance with the interim rules, the opportunity for repeat testing goes away. It's one and done, basically, per the, per the federal rules, which we need to be compl in compliance with. But up until October 31st, that repeat analysis uh, opportunity will, will remain in place. So I have a quick question. As a hemp grower, am I going to go to jail if my crop tests hot? No. Uh, I mean, so the, the, I mean, if you, if you harvested it um, and did things, you know, after you were, after we communicated to you that your, your crop was hot, the law basically requires that MDAR would then issue a destruction order, which would require me to destroy the crop. We didn't have to do that in the 2019 season. Uh, the folks that, you know, we had 15% or so non-compliance, and uh, those growers just chose to destroy the crops themselves rather than to either submit a second sample or to do anything else. So there are penalty provisions in the law, just like there are with any law. Um, there is jail time in the law if you falsify a sample, submit a sample that's not really yours, that maybe you know is compliant from another test result. But, um, you know, our, our intent, especially because this is so new in, in Michigan, is, and this is, this is typical with, with, M, with any MDAR program, we choose to take a compliance assistance approach versus a heavy-handed approach. I'm not interested in throwing anybody in jail. We're going to work with you, but you need to be uh, doing your due diligence as well, uh, especially with this, because of this crop being so fickle. You know, we, we know that growers can do, can think they're doing everything right. They do their due diligence before they buy their seed. They plant it. They pay attention to it throughout the growing season. And it could still test hot. And so uh, as part of the interim rules, um, there will be language that says that if a grower has done this due diligence, you know, there's, they're not going to be, uh, they call it a negligent violation. Um, they allow up to 0.5%. Uh, you still have to destroy the crop, but you wouldn't be negligently vi um, violating the law. So that's probably a little bit more. Let me elaborate on that. Uh, so in 2014, or 15, um, in Kentucky, we used to have to sign an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, before we had all this USDA stuff involved. Uh, and we received a 300 pound shipment, and I tested this stuff from three different shops, testing facilities, and we tested it four or five times, and it was 0 0.5 to 0 0.8. And um, at that time, we used to have this little blue card from the DEA, it's like an import permit. And you don't, nobody will get these now, they've eliminated all this, but on there on the DEA permit, it would tell you who to call. There was like an 800 number on there if you had a problem. So you call the number, well, it cycles you over to Detroit. <laughs> so I called Detroit and I said, he says, how can I help you? And I said, well, I've got a problem with the hump, and I'm part of the KDA, and i got an MDAR license, and da-da-da, you -da know, -da, the whole rundown. And the agent says, uh, well, uh, I told him how much it, it was testing at, and he says, you got to destroy it. And it was that quick. He says, you got to destroy it. So I'm not legally going to get in trouble. Not at all. He says, uh, I said, I got a certificate from Kentucky right from the KDA that said it was 0 
Although, no matter how many times we tested it and how many times different variations we did it, it was at the lowest 0 0.5. So I did, there was no criminal charges. What he did, the DEA agent did, while I was pretty much crying because uh, we had already paid for the hemp and we knew we weren't going to get that farmer to reimburse our money back. It was going to be a total loss for us, which it was. Uh, we poured gas on it and we filmed it with the uh, camera and then I had to email that to the DEA agent in Detroit and uh, proved to him that we burnt that 300 pounds of it. So there has been destruction in one crop one time by us, but it was a Kentucky grown crop. I'm sure the DEA has it on file. We'll look into it. But uh, there was no criminal charges. Question. Did you have my questions for Gina at the beginning? You were talking about myths. Could you give an example of the myths that you were relating to? Myths like the probably myth. M Y D A. Myth of the hemp. Yeah. You wanted to open up uh, one of your your first folder you wanted to open up was myths. Oh, oh yeah, that stands for Michigan Farmer. I mean, it was the it was the presentation that I gave on Saturday. The myths presentation, the Michigan Future Farmers or something like that. I don't know what to call it, but. Yeah, no, myth, you're saying M-Y-T-H. That's what I heard. Yeah, and yeah, no, I, was, I was hoping to find on this stupid jump drive um, the presentation that I gave on Saturday for a different meeting, which is for myths. It's a group that is future farmers, Michigan future farmers, something like that. This is one I hear all the time. Uh, people come in and say, uh, oh, this hemp, it's just a male marijuana plant, right? No, it's not right. That's the biggest one. I probably hear that repeated. Um, also, people think with CBD oil that's full spectrum that has THC in it, that they take one little drop and they're going to fail drug tests. From reports I've read, you have to take thousands of milligrams of it per day for it to be able to pop during a, a drug test. Yeah, I think that's what a lot of people worry about when they yeah. want to take the CBD products. Yes, that is with CBD um, or because we have Spark the City here and we have Dow and Midland, Bigham, the two top, or I'm sorry, uh, Dow and the hospital, two top employees, and a lot of people want to get a CBD. Um, one of the biggest things is they're worried about if um, they use a topical that's full spectrum that has THC in it, that they will, it will get into their system or they'll get high, which is it's false. You know, through a topical, anything, anything that has a full spectrum is not going to pop in your drug test. It's not going to get bloodstream. Not a transdermal patch, so so that's on my side of the house. That's what I, I hear that. Thank you. Right here. Thank you for giving this question because I know we're near the end. Just curious, what the expectations are for next year for acreage in terms both of scale as well as distribution between seed, fiber, and cannabinoid production. So this is where I always want to have a crystal ball handy, um, but I don't, unfortunately. Um, I don't know that. Um, we had growers, um, so growers have to identify their acreage on their applications. Um, we had, like I said on that very first couple of slides, over 15,000 acres that growers had identified that they were going to plant this year and 10 plus million square feet indoors. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, growers did not plant that much. We're still in the process of summarizing 2019 data that will tell us exactly how much was planted in Michigan. I don't have that number right now because we're still chasing some of those reports, but I would guess that we probably wrapped up the, the 29, 2019 season with, I don't know, maybe somewhere around 6,000 acres actually planted. I don't know about the indoor uh, square feet yet. I think that's probably a little bit more predictable than the outdoor acreage. Um, so um, in the future, we'll have more accurate data. It's, it's hard to predict what the 2020 season is going to be. I've heard people still really excited and enthusiastic and wanting to plant this. And then I've heard others that say, ah, I'm going to sit this one out until we figure out what the federal rules really are going to end up being. You know, there's, there's a lot of nervousness out there um, about the all or nothing. It's either compliant or it's not, and you destroy it. 
And I know that that was an area of heartburn um, for a lot of state regulatory agencies, a lot of people. Um, when you think about the, the many uses of this plant, and you know, if it were to test in, let's say, at a 0.6 or 0.7, technically it would be not compliant, have to be destroyed, but you know, why? I mean, why can't it be redirected to, let's say, a, a industrial use of some sort, of fiber or concrete? All these different uses where really the THC content is really, it's not being ingested, so what's the big deal, right? Well, that's the feds, you know, they have to figure that out. If And I know that they're going to be talking to you DEA to see where those flexibilities may arise. You know, my goal is that, you know, if it does test out of compliant, then, you know, why can't we redirect it to a different market where it's not going to be ingested? That's, you know, me and my happy place, though. It's, it's really going to boil down to what the federal government will allow. Do you expect an increase in acreage in this next year or too early to tell? You know, it's it's too early to tell. I mean, I, I think, and, and Mike and others who actually grew this year can probably attest to this, but a good 60% of the growers in Michigan grew for CBD purposes. And right now they're sitting on their half because the prices are, are really, really huge. So um, that may cause uh, people to rethink, number one, if they want to grow it at all, or number two, if they want to grow it for other purposes. Um, Primarily grown in Michigan in 2019 for CBD, although we did have some fiber and some grain growers, but but not even close to who grew for uh, CBD. Mike, maybe you can talk about the market and how that might impact what we plant. Yes, yeah, so we worked with uh, I don't know, probably at least uh, 40 growers this last year, all all for CBD. Um, I think Gene is right. If I had to throw a dart, I'd probably say six to seven thousand acres. Um, probably got planted the bulk of it. I mean, I would say 80%. I would guess CBD. We're having a lot of interest though this year, so I mean, I think acreage is going to increase. Um, even some of the farmers that stumbled a little bit last year, learning curves. Um, we haven't had any of those we're working with that say they're not going to grow any. Some are going to back down a little bit. Um, the biggest thing is finding a processor uh, to get teamed up with to know your stuff's going to get processed. Uh, we're currently just in our warehouse alone, I mean, we're we're sitting on probably about a half a million pounds of biomass right now that we're working through. Um, we get calls every other day, people that want us to buy their biomass from them. Uh, we're not currently buying right now just because we're sitting on such an inventory, trying to get work through. So all those growers um, that are kind of left out there hanging, you know, they're, they're a little reluctant, you know, it's time to order seed right now and starts and these things and get things booked for this year, but they're still sitting on last year's inventory. So, those are the ones that are having a little bit of a hard time and deciding, hey, is this for me or not? But some of that stuff as we build infrastructure, uh, definitely for the grain and fiber that needs to be built. There's nothing around here uh, to, to do anything with grain and fiber, really. Um, there are a few contracts you can get on the grain side. We're seeing some things, you know, this new hemp wood and different things that are happening across the country. I mean, things are coming, but until people put those processing plants in, um, it's just going to be a little while yet before before we can do much with those other other things. That's why the CBD is so big. At least there is some some need and, and at least some processor availability out there for those. So. Let, let me elaborate too. So we, we grew a half an acre and uh, we profited over a hundred thousand dollars on our little farm. But like I said when I started, find a buyer and a contract before you ever start. Before we ever planted one seed, we already had a contract in place. Uh, we, we were completely sold out uh, before it was dry. Uh, we're not buying either. Uh, I'm sitting on probably $150,000 worth of oil right now, uh, which will be manufactured in these little muscle rocks that we make uh, on the farm. And they were really good. Uh, it's, it, we, we, eight of the uh, uh, 12 ingredients in our muscle rock is grown on the farm. Uh, so it's a very local product. But the reason I mention that is because if you're going to do hemp and you grow a small amount to try out your, your luck at it, you may have to create your own product line to get your hemp sold. 
Uh, if you don't have someone who's ready to buy it from you, that's your alternative besides sitting on it in your barn or in some warehouse. Uh, we grew 2,000 plants last year. We're only growing 1,000 this year. That's it. We're going to be cut back. There's no need. The demand's not there. The market's oversaturated. I'm not trying to deter any of you. Our organization likes to give you low risk advice, you know, minim mitigate your damages. All right, I'm going to cut it off here because we have to get this party wrapped up. Um, I appreciate everybody for coming tonight. They've been traveling the state um, and doing these talks for the, the last month or so, so they've been very busy. Appreciate them taking the time to come to this program for us.